Well, that's not that unusual, actually. There are other world cities that are going down that route, particularly in Europe. Uh, Copenhagen will probably be the first city to get 100% renewable energy. They have a target in place for uh, doing that by 2025. So that will be five years earlier than us if we were to actually do that by 2030. So it makes common sense to start off with a 100% renewable energy policy. The problems that you have with having a target like 20% or 30% or even 50%, it's really supermarket trolley renewable energy. It's people walking around saying, I have one of these, I have one of these, I've got no idea if it's actually going to deliver for them. So it's important to start off with a 100% renewable energy policy to discipline you, to force you to work out what components of the different sorts of renewable energy generation and supply and how much quantum of each, and particularly to overcome the intermittency of renewable energy that you need. You can have sub-targets to get you there, but it's extremely important from the technical point of view to have a 100% renewable energy policy first so that you do the correct calculations because you're replacing a fossil fuel grid and you cannot do that with a random selection of solar and wind or other technologies. They've got to work together. 2007, our tree line community on the plains of western Kansas, a small rural community, our lives changed in a blink of an eye. We went from this to this. 95% of the community was totally leveled to rubble by an EF5 tornado with sustained winds of 205 miles an hour. We lost everything. In a matter of minutes, we were all homeless, so it didn't matter our social economic status in the community. The true sustainable green thing we had in life was each other and our relationships with each other. We had five and 600 people that show up for community meetings and right off the bat, they start talking about green and sustainable, and I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was born and raised on a farm 17 miles from town. We did everything sustainable. We were green. All I could think about was 1968, powder blue bell-bottom pants, tie-dyed shirt, big white belt buckle, hair down to here, maybe on mind-altering chemicals, hugging a tree. The reason I say that is we've had a misconception and we've made political football out of being sustainable and green and being good stewards of our resources. So what we need to do in this process of planning and moving boldly into the future is we had to involve all the stakeholders in these community meetings. It was a ground-up process. We didn't rely on the governor's office or, the, or FEMA or any of that to drive our thought process. And what we, how we package this in our mind, and especially me, is it's about my ancestors, your ancestors, the original green people. My ancestors, the first thing they did when they settled on the plains or anywhere in the Midwest was they drilled a water well that they put up a windmill to use the wind to pump life-sustaining water for them and their livestock and their gardens. Then they moved that through their cooling house that they built, geothermal, to cool the milk and eggs. And at the same time, they dug a root cellar to put their crops for the summer in for the winter, geothermal, below the ground. We pumped the water into a tower and we heated it with the solar heat and took a hot shower at night. Now, I contend, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what we're trying to do today. You saw all kinds of buildings today and all kinds of things you're going to see later and you're going to talk about. The history and heritage is there. It's that we have the modern technology and the fortitude to make this happen. And we need to make it happen. But make sure you celebrate successes. Do not let suboptimal people cloud your vision of a brighter tomorrow. <laughs> this is a rehab county courthouse that's lead gold. There's 32 geothermal wells there. By the way, the school has 96 geothermal wells and its own wind turbine. The hospital has geothermal wells and its own wind turbine and solar PV. We are a living laboratory. Come visit. Inrail says, let's put in 
a community win for them? Is there, how can we do it? Through public-private partnerships, we're able to, we generate 12 and a half megawatts. Our peak loads four and a half megawatts. The rest goes on the grid and is, is shared by uh, 32 other cities in our power pool that uh, can say part of their portfolio comes from the wind. Vision without action is merely a dream. Merely a dream. And if you just have action without a vision, you're just passing time. So if we take action with true vision, we can change the world. Whether or not I was a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian, or a member of the Pig Party, did not matter. It's science. It is not a political issue. It should never be in the political domain. A lot of it is because of just the confluence of, of coincidences that occurred that enabled us to get there faster. But I think the real reason is, is because we intend to be net zero before anyone else. And that competitiveness is, has kind of captured the city. We really do have to segment the people we're talking to and put it into a frame that they will relate to and will be motivated by it. Another thing we did is, and it's an invitation to all of you, you have a renewable energy source or idea or a startup, and it makes sense to us, come to Lancaster. You will have my cell phone number. When city staff tells you that you will have a permit on a certain day, you will have it on that day, or you call me. The staff in that city is now a staff that looks for reasons to say yes. Most city staffs, the default is to say no. If you started electing local officials who had a default of yes, could you imagine how quickly this would change? I mean, it is really insane when it's, an ec it's economically viable. It's technologically possible. Every house should have solar on it, shouldn't it? Solar in our community and even wind if you want to put a windmill in your house, is over the counter. Ask yourself this. If you want to have net zero buildings, who should you be talking to? The president? The governor? Or the guy who says what goes on the permit? That's your mayors. We tell you what the rules are for building. You know, I mean, we're just a small little city in L.A. County. And, you know, we're like every other city in California. We have no money. It was just done because the people that are involved in their community decided that this really was important enough to take on. Now, there is silence. You see? 473 million kilowatts in 2009. That's on the left side, right. On the right side, 40 biomass plants, photovoltaics. I think it's not 2,400, perhaps 3,000 today, and 149 turbines. And you see the electricity generation out of the renewable energies, 104%. We export 4%. <laughs> As of 2013, the Palo Alto Municipal Utility is delivering 100% carbon neutral electricity to its residential and commercial customers. Uh, that's carbon neutral both through renewable energy that we're actually purchasing and delivering as well as through RECS renewable energy credits or carbon offsets that we're providing to offset the emissions from the parts of the portfolio that aren't yet renewable. That's the first step. The second step is that by 2017, the portfolio will be 100% renewable energy across the board without, uh, without the RECs, without the offsets. And this is a big deal. There are very few cities that have accomplished this. I think Seattle was one of the earliest in the United States because of the massive hydropower resources that Seattle has had. Uh, for Palo Alto, it's taken a concerted and focused program to identify resources, to develop power purchase agreements, to work out the economics, and to be able to deliver cost-effective renewable energy uh, to the entire customer base 
of the Palo Alto Utilities.